Welcome. Independence was an achievement, a genuine achievement. And the first taste of freedom in Africa was sweet, but it didn't last. The taste turned sour. The honeymoon ended, the kwacha, the dawn clouded over. Although the degree of decline certainly varied widely and in some places never occurred at all, there's no avoiding the conclusion that in much of Africa, the hope and promise of independence changed to disillusionment. In this lecture, we focus on the political, social aspects of this story, and in the next lecture, on the economic. Now, we've seen repeatedly in recent lectures that state power was central or more than central, maybe all important, in the overall political economies constructed in the colonial period and carried over into the independent countries. Important implications flow from this fact. In more developed and diversified uh, societies, there are, to put it bluntly, many ways, many avenues, many paths to do rather well Financially, a politician or a bureaucrat in such places who loses his or her uh, position, job, through elections or, or otherwise, can turn to a host of other occupations. You can go back to the law firm, to the law practice, where so many seem to, to come from, of course. You can become a lobbyist. We all know what the revolving door between Congress and the lobbying organizations is like in a, in a town like Washington, D.C. You can turn to business. This was far less the case in the new African nations. Getting access to the state machinery at high stations or at low was, in a sense, the name of the game. And it often seemed to be the only game. And that, in turn, meant that it was a game likely to be played with considerable seriousness, if not indeed with deadly ferocity. As is so often the case, I think we can get a better feel for this by, by turning to an artist. And in fact, we'll do that by turning to one we've, we've turned to before, uh, none other than Chenua Achebe, the legendary uh, writer out of uh, Nigeria. And in this case, I want to turn to his novel entitled A Man of the People. Uh, and I will just mention in passing that this book was published in the United States in 1967. The copyright held by Achebe is 1966. I assume that he was writing it in 1965 and 66. And in that sense, it is an incredible forecast of what his home country, Nigeria, was about to experience. Um, we'll come back to that story in a moment, but I'll just say that in some respects, it bears a comparison with a book like The Quiet American by, by Graham Greene, published in 1955, and yet extremely prescient about what the future might bring uh, in the history between Vietnam and the United States. Okay, let's set the scene here for this excerpt from A Man of the People. Our protagonist, who's a bright young man, uh, has gone and he has uh, spent an evening uh, with a member of parliament in the newly uh, independent African nation, in fact, a minister, and he's sort of dazzled by it. He's, uh, his host, uh, whose name is Nanga, uh, is known for his, his ebullient personality, his generosity, and um, also known, increasingly suspected, to be engaging in illegal activities, uh, in corruption. So the protagonist, after dinner, after the, the after dinner drinks, goes back to his uh, well-appointed room, and I'll pick it up at that point. I was simply hypnotized by the luxury of the great suite assigned to me. When I lay down in that double bed, that seemed to ride on a cushion of air and switched on the reading lamp and saw the beautiful furniture anew 
From the lying down position and looked beyond the door to the gleaming bathroom and the towels as large as a lapa, I had to confess that if I were at that moment made a minister, I would be most anxious to remain one forever. We ignore man's basic nature if we say, as some critics do, that because a man like Nanga had risen overnight from poverty and insignificance to his present opulence, he could be persuaded without much trouble to give it up again and return to his original state. A man who has just come in from the rain and dried his body and put on dry clothes is more reluctant to go out again than another who has been indoors all the time. The trouble with our new nation, as I saw it then lying on that bed, was that none of us had been indoors long enough to be able to say to hell with it. We had all been in the rain together until yesterday. Then a handful of us, the smart and the lucky and hardly ever the best, had scrambled for the one shelter our former rulers left and had taken it over and barricaded themselves in. And from within, they sought to persuade the rest through numerous loudspeakers that the first phase of the struggle had been won and that the next phase, the extension of our house, was even more important and called for new and original tactics. It required that all argument should cease and the whole people speak with one voice and that any more dissent and argument outside the door of the shelter would subvert and bring down the whole house. So if I can paraphrase here, some of the highlights from that passage from Achebe. If you were inside what he called the one shelter our former rulers left, as Achebe described it, he's talking, of course, about the, the state, formerly colonial, now independent. If you were inside, you wanted and intended to stay inside. And to those outside, you said, stop your clamoring. Though you are there and I am here, we must think of ourselves as one. We're doing everything we can and we'll pass you morsels through the window. Or to change the metaphor, our challenges are great. Our enemies, often erstwhile imperialists, are many. Don't rock the boat, else we all shall sink. So opposition, dissent, competition came increasingly to be seen as threat, and depending on the case, as treacherous threat even, indeed, treasonous threat. Now, the upshot of all of this was the move almost everywhere in Africa to greater authoritarianism. The open multi-party parliamentary systems left behind by the departing colonialists began to be abandoned. But remember that these had begun life very late in the colonial day in a sort of deathbed conversion to the, the virtues of dispensing uh, democracy. The colonies, after all, had been quite autocratic institutions themselves until late in the day. The late historian Michael Crowder once wrote an article whose title, uh, a, a play on the title of a, of a, of a play in the, in the 1980s. The title of his article was, Whose Dream Was It Anyway? And he sort of challenges the notion, this dream, and concludes that it was a bit of a pipe dream to have expected that uh, these plants of Western-style parliamentary democracy with such shallow roots uh, would, would thrive. Instead, they were rather easily stunted. Now, one option chosen by a great many rulers was the declaration of the one-party state. It's an important term uh, for much of recent African history. As so often, positively or negatively, Nkrumah of Ghana led the way. But all the great ones, Kenyatta, Nyerere, Kaunda, Banda, Hufwebwani, Sangor, all of them followed suit. In all of those countries led by the legendary nationalists of the nationalist generation, the one-party state became the legal reality uh, a decade or so uh, after independence. Now, at its best and most sophisticated, the one-party state was, was posited, was put forward as a more authentically African political mo model than the imported one. Indeed, I often hear people 
say, people in Africa, especially people who are sympathetic to Africa uh, in, in this country, in the United States, will say, well, you know, it seems that what's needed here is, is something more authentic, uh, something rooted in African. Maybe they can find or return to, to something that is a more authentic form of, of governing. But I think it's important to recognize that it's not like this has never been tried. The one-party state, again, at its best, was an attempt in precisely that direction. The arguments went something like this, that rather than this constant negative competition, uh, this dragging each other down, uh, we, we should look for uh, a search, we should search indeed for consensus. And the imagery drawn here, and this is why I say they, they hearkened back to something they, they argue was more authentic, you know, rather like the village gathering of, of old. You don't take a vote, you stay there until a decision is reached by some sort of, of uh, consensus. So the notion that, you know, first past the post, that winner takes all, that's kind of, that kind of thing, uh, was, was um, it, that it had negative ramifications. Uh, again, the, the argument sometimes taken to be our challenges are so great, whether that challenge is to mobilize for development or increasingly to foil the, the lurking imperialists. Uh, it, it, we cannot afford the luxury, and that's how it was often put, uh, the wasted time of, of disunity. So, again, at its most positive in the, in the uh, formulations presented by some some brilliant minds like Julius Nyerere in Tanzania or, or Kenneth Kaunda in, in Zambia. They argued in this vein that we can, we can move to a one-party state and indeed in their formulations of it, uh, with considerable reality, uh, reality, they permitted within the single ruling party a fair amount of competition and dissent. You can see this particularly perhaps in, in Tanzania where I think this, this idea had, the, had perhaps the greatest uh, reality. Even during the one-party era in Tanzania, it was relatively common for some prominent politicians, members of parliament, and indeed quite often ministers, to be thrown out of office, to be defeated at the polls by a challenger who, it's true, had to be vetted by the party uh, leadership and so on, but nonetheless was able to compete against someone in power and, and replace them. I, you know, I, it, it, it comes down to sometimes what are your measures for, for the vitality of a democracy? One measure that some would be is how frequently do you get, you know, the rascals being thrown out? And in Tanzania, at least, that was with some frequency. Voter turnout. In Tanzania's one-party era, voter turnout was often in the 70, 80 percent range, 90 occasionally. And they, that was under a one-party uh, system and with, the evidence suggests, relatively little compulsion. That's certainly a considerably higher proportion than one gets in the elections in the United States, for instance, particularly off-year uh, congressional elections. Okay, now I've said repeatedly here the one-party state at its best. The fact is, the one-party state operated at its worst in quite a number of other cases. And in these instances, the one-party state was simply a quite transparent cloak, if you will, for iron dictatorship. The new emperors, in many cases, had no genuine ideological clothes, they had naked power. So the one-party state was one aspect of what Ali Mazrui, the East African uh, scholar, calls the search for stability. And indeed, if you measure stability by longevity in office, several of the rulers mentioned above uh, found it by turning to the one-party state. Senghor, in power for 20 years in Senegal. Houphoué, something close to 30 in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Kenyatta, for 15 years in Kenya and only ended with his death. Yereri, for 24, actually, in uh, Tanzania. Uh, 
Uh, Kaunda, 27 years in Zambia, and Mobutu, 32 in, in the Congo, or Zaire, as he called it. Now, in many cases, longevity was papering over uh, growing instability. But even stability as measured strictly by longevity in office was not the case, was elusive in a great many other places. So, what were the threats to stability? One of them, certainly, was ethnic conflict. As we know, almost all the African countries contained numerous nations, if you will, ethnic groups, so-called tribes, and faced a rather daunting task before and after independence of building a new and larger sense of national identity based on the externally imposed units. Why did Kaunda start every rally with one Zambia and have the crowd shout back to him, one nation, trying to build that, that new form of, of national identity? Now, in my view, there's nothing natural, it's often assumed to be, or inevitable, it's often assumed to be about ethnic conflict or ethnic difference. Tolerance and coexistence are just as common historically between ethnic groups as, as conflict. But it's also not surprising that in a struggle, uh, in an arena, the state arena, over quite limited resources in these new nations and with these greatly heightened expectations and hopes, it's not surprising, shouldn't be surprising to us, that people often mobilized around ethnic lines. As we stressed early on, and I always stress when I talk about ethnicity or, or so-called tribe or nation in Africa, ethnicity is fluid, it's changeable, it's expandable, it's contractible, etc. And you can see this in the, the uh, history of previously quite separate communities uh, coming together to mobilize as an ethnic bloc. I've seen this in southern Zambia where you find that uh, peoples who often had conceived of themselves as, as separate tribes, if you like, separate uh, ethnic groups, begin to discover, uh, or at the very least, begin to emphasize cultural affinities, cultural similarities, common identities. Why? I'd suggest partly to mobilize for power, for resources, for a piece of, of the pie. Now, in its benign form, in its more benign form, this is common to politics uh, in, in very many places. The situation I'm describing could lead, for instance, in Africa, as it has elsewhere, to to ethnic balancing acts, you know, taking the, the, the cabinet and making sure that there are enough from the east and from the west and enough Bimba, enough Lozi, enough Nyanja, enough Tonga, so that indeed everybody gets a, a piece of the pie and, and, and keeps the, the lid of satisfaction on. This is quite familiar to any student, I think, of, say, American uh, politics. Uh, again, something quite common. So the benign form there. But in certain circumstances in these African nations, to use Crowder's term, cobbled together at one point, he's talking about the borders and the artificiality of the borders constructed uh, at, during the scramble. In certain circumstances, this ethnic reality was dynamite. The most obvious example here was Achebe's home country, Nigeria, the most populous country in all of Africa Again, something like one out of every five or six uh, Africans on the continent today uh, is a Nigerian. In Nigeria, uh, we find three large ethnic blocs, there are many smaller ones, uh, coexisting in the past and, and in the present uneasily. The Hausa and Fulani uh, in, the, in the north, uh, heavily Islamic area there, the Yoruba, in the southwest, who probably had the, the greatest prosperity in the middle, at least, of the colonial period because of cocoa production, and the Igbo uh, peoples in the southeast. Now, the Igbo in particular, and this, in fact, uh, is Achebe's home uh, ethnic group, the Igbo in particular had taken to Western education with alacrity and often wound up in relatively elevated positions all through 
uh, the country of Nigeria. In other words, they would get a position in the bureaucracy and be posted to the north or the west or to the capital or what have you. To uh, some extent, this is echoed in commercial life uh, as well. They found themselves, the Igbo people then uh, increasingly found themselves to be the, the targets of, uh, frankly, of, of resentment. Now, all of this exploded uh, in 1966 on the occasion of uh, Nigeria's first military coup, and it erupted in the north, uh, what can only be called pogroms, um, systematic attacks resulting in thousands of deaths of Igbo were carried out in northern Nigeria in 1966. A great number of Igbo from there and from elsewhere in uh, Nigeria uh, retreated, if you like, to their home area in the southeast. And leaders led by uh, Colonel Ajuku in the southeast essentially declared independence. They attempted to secede from Nigeria, and the name that they gave their fledgling or would-be potential new nation was Biafra. This all took off in 1967. Nigeria's rulers had other ideas, as you might expect, and a bloody civil war raged from 1967 to, to 1970. This was the first time that I personally can remember the images that have become so distressingly familiar of uh, essentially hungry or starving children, in this case, um, the results of uh, food cordons or, uh, yes, uh, prevention of food getting through into southeastern Nigeria. Now, at the war's end, the military ruler of Nigeria, Yokubu Gowan, uh, adopted a very Lincoln-esque posture and uh, asserted that there would be no victors, uh, no vanquished, uh, and so on. So, Nigerian unity prevailed. But anyone can see, 35 years later, that it remains precarious. Another threat to stability was the military coup, which I mentioned in passing a moment ago. As no less than Mao Zedong uh, said famously, power comes from the barrel of a gun. And it is true that any leader anywhere without a loyal army is vulnerable. There's a paradox here, at least on the surface, because coups were often launched precisely in the name of restoring stability, of combating indiscipline and corruption. We'll come to corruption in, in a moment. Uh, the, the officers involved, often young ones, uh, the notion was we'll, we'll set things right, and then after we've righted the ship, we'll return to the barracks. Now, Frankly, that rarely happened, although it was not unknown. The problem was that once the precedent was set, a new group of officers would get the same idea. Yet again, Nkrumah, in the lead. The shock of his overthrow in 1966, I mean Nkrumah, the, the father of African nationalism, Overthrown, leaves the country as part of his uh, grander and grander international ambitions, actually left the country to pursue uh, diplomatic uh, matters related to Vietnam uh, in, in 1966. Overthrown, not permitted to come back. The image of people pulling down the statue of himself, which Nkrumah had put up in the main, in the capital city and smashing it to bits. It was shocking. But the shock diminished as coup after coup, over 150 of them in all, became a dismally familiar bit of news out of Africa. Now finally, and, and obviously we must mention corruption. We looked briefly at the Congo, or Zaire's Mobutu, who has to be considered the all-time champion. But many, many others found it impossible to resist the temptation, as Achebe put it, once they were inside the shelter, albeit on a, a vastly diminished scale from, from Mobutu. Some saw themselves as deserving after all those years of struggle, after, again, a Achebe's image, after all those years of being out, out there in the rain, you know? 
Others, as uh, the fine political scientist Peter Ecke suggests, saw the state arena as, as an alien trough. He suggests that this was seen as an alien implantation and therefore not subject to traditional uh, African mores about uh, accountability and, and honesty. Again, it echoes Michael Crowder's notion of whose dream was this anyway? If this is an alien thing, then it doesn't pack the same uh, moral punch or immoral punch to, to feed at that trough. Eventually, as the Ghanaian novelist Ai Kwai Arma in his book The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, which is a thinly disguised uh, parable, really, about the overthrow of, of Nkrumah, he showed brilliantly in that novel that at some point to many people, it simply seems stupid rather than courageous not to, to join in uh, this, this free-for-all. Now, the larger problem, in a way, was that it was often what I'll call dead-end corruption. After all, I, mean, I take it that corruption at, uh, of various types and to various degrees is, is a universal. I, I, I simply think that there is no such thing as a, as a political system or, or a society that is free of corruption. It's a question of degree. It's a question of whether ordinary people can get on with their lives uh, without running into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And it's a question of whether what corruption does take uh, uh, place is simply a payoff. In other words, you pay off somebody so that you don't get in bigger trouble. You pay off the police commissioner or the, the cop at the roadblock or what have you. Uh, you know, dead-end corruption like straightforward uh, rip-offs of foreign aid money, such as Mobutu unquestionably carried out. In other words, Dead in corruption like that, not, unfortunately, a sort of commission on a project that might otherwise be genuinely productive. I'm going to paraphrase a story that comes from uh, the book written by Keith Richburg, the African-American journalist who reported uh, for the, the Washington Post for, for quite a number of years from Africa. And it's a story that he was told in, in Africa. And it goes something like this that there are two quite brilliant, outstanding uh, young men students. One from an African nation, one from an East Asian nation, or Southeast Asian uh, nation. One of those economies called the Asian Tigers, uh, eventually. They both earn scholarships, and they both go to, to, to Britain and study at a place like Cambridge or Oxford, study finance, they both come back and become prominent in their home countries, occupy positions like ministers of, of finance, and so on. And finally, 20 years later or so, uh, they visit each other. First, the, the African uh, man goes to visit his Asian friend, finds him in a, a very uh, luxurious home with a swimming pool. They're out there on the deck and, and overlooking the city, and he sees the freeways and the skyscrapers, the apartment blocks, um, uh, waving palm trees and so on. And the African asks his Asian uh, friend, uh, well, how did you do so well here? How did you get into such good circumstances? And uh, the Asian friend waves his hand at the city below and, and says, 10%. And then the next year, according to Richburg, the visit is reversed, and the Asian gentleman visits his African friend, finds him in an equally sumptuous uh, domestic palace with a beautiful home, and again, the swimming pool on the hill, elevated, overlooking the city. But they're looking at streets with potholes, with bridges that haven't been repaired, with crumbling skyscrapers and uh, falling down apartment blocks and so forth. And according to Richburg, the, the Asian friend asks his African friend, well, how did, you, how did you do so well? And the African friend waves his hand at the city and says, 100%. That's what I'm getting at here in terms of corruption is, I assume, going to happen. But the degree and what it also accompanies, whether productive or not, is clearly an additional issue. So, coups, conflict, and corruption. That's the title of a Time Magazine cover story uh, from the mid-1980s. It's a picture that was 
uh, is exaggerated in the West for sure. But it was real enough, and it wasn't Westerners who were paying the price. Thank you.